Hey, somebody's got to clean the fish. You have? Excellent. afternoon or evening you are listening to the professional noticer that's well, famous stuff a lot of celebrities use that radio announcers and everything here you and i will use common sense and all the wisdom we can muster to move beyond what is true and go all the way to the truth this is uh this is heavy duty doc this is great creating measurable results for people like you and families like yours, no longer a member of the amateur ranks, I am the professional noticer. Prepare to be astonished. Hello, everyone. I'm Andy Andrews. Hey, thank you for making me a part of your week. While our topics might seem to vary wildly at times, it is because the things you care about most are often greatly affected by the things you care about least. Therefore, we will field questions about business, spiritual issues, popular culture, and how exactly do you give a pill to a cat? My purpose here, today and with every show we do, is to play the part of a best friend or a coach. I want to help you live the life you would live if all your toughest questions were answered. The Professional Noticer is sponsored this week by Kamado Joe Grills the best grill, and the best color for a grill. (laughs) I wrote that uh, last part myself. Observations and answers. That's what we do here. Every week I toss out a few observations and provide the questions. Then we harness common sense and wisdom to plow through the issue all the way to an answer for you. So, here's what I'm seeing this week. Our observation topic is discipline in reverse. We we don't always have an observation topic, but if we had to uh, title this, it would be discipline in reverse. You know, I read a lot of uh, history, uh, read a lot of odd history. I'm probably the only person you ever met uh, who who has read the entire Nuremberg trial transcripts. Uh, Pretty boring, but I found uh, a couple of amazing rabbit trails to go down. And so my, my point is... I I am curious about odd history. I'm curious about trying to uh, connect something that I read with an observation that I make. One of the things that I love to read is I love to read stuff from years and years and years ago that famous people have written themselves. I mean, right now, today, in today's world, if you read a autobiography Uh, by a famous person, it's generally couched in such uh, thoughtful language or uh, couched in such a way as to make them look good that that sometimes they're not worth reading. I I would rather read a biography uh, or an... I would rather read an autobiography of the guy who stood next to the famous person and you don't really know who that, that guy was, all right? But those autobiographies, those are, you know, why why is this guy not going to tell the truth? What does he care? And so they're often very interesting. But I like to read autobiographies from years and years ago before politically correct became a thing. And uh, I I like to read stuff that the famous person wrote themselves. Uh, Kings are a great... I guess a great example of that. You know, for centuries, they've been keeping whatever a king wrote. They've been keeping whatever a king did. All right, you know, if the queen ate with that fork 500 years ago, you can bet it's in a museum somewhere because somebody kept it and said, well, you know, the queen ate with this. <laughs> and so they kept so they kept everything that kings and queens wrote as well. I There's... Uh, you know, one, uh, King Solomon was an example of a king 
who really kind of, you know, what we say today has the fruit on the tree. I mean, this guy was uh, is considered by historians to have been the wealthiest person in the history of planet Earth. And um, he was uh, considered by many scholars as the wisest person who ever lived. And of course, everything he wrote is is, is still available. You you can find it. And and I personally he, he, I'll just tell you he's not a great writer, all right? As far as uh you know, if you compare King Solomon to John Grisham, you're going to go, well, Grisham's a better writer. But he wasn't writing as a writer. Anything you read, he was writing with a purpose. He was writing to tell you something. He was writing to tell, uh, frankly, he was writing to tell the subjects of his kingdom how to live. So when I say he wasn't really a great writer, it's stuff like, uh, do this, do this. Why do you want to do this? Well, this is how you do this. Well, you don't want to do this because this will happen. And and it's just like one after the other after the other. And so it can seem a little bit like, whew, really? And, um, and of course, you know, being somebody as <sighs> independent as I am, just the thought of somebody saying, hey, this is how you should live your life, <laughs> somehow that kind of rubs me the wrong way. And so I... I read a lot of the the stuff from King Solomon at first with one eyebrow raised and and I you know I'm I am uh, often very curious about going all the way to the bottom of the pool. I want to go to the bottom of the pool about why somebody does something like this and what happens because they did it and why would they and and you know I'm really into understanding rationalization of actions um and so I I ask myself that one day you know why is this guy I mean is he just like an egomaniac I mean so I have the ability to tell everybody what to do, and so I'm going to. I mean, you'd think he'd rather do something. You'd, you'd think there would be more to being a king and more fun things to do. You know, today, I'm going to go ride 10 different horses. I, I don't know. I Today, I'm going to go fish in 15 different kingdom ponds. I, I don't know. It just seems like there would be a lot more fun things to do than sit around and figure out things to tell people. And and so that became a question for me. You know, why would he do that? Okay, well, here's here's your answer. This is what I believe the answer is. You know, if 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 uh, King Solomon was the wealthiest person, historians say he was the wealthiest person in the history of the planet. Okay, well, now his dad was David. You remember that? Remember David, the guy who killed the giant and. Uh, killed the bear and and that kind of stuff. His dad was David. A lot of stuff that David wrote is available too. But his dad was David. Now, David was a warrior. That's what he was. Uh, in fact, if you read history about David, about King David, his, his like, town or whatever, uh, you know, it... It all seemed like an armed camp. I mean, there weren't, you know, Solomon, you read about Solomon one generation later, and it's about uh, temples and gold thrones. And, well, if you really dig into this stuff, there was a point, you know, that the David, the dad, he's a warrior. He's capturing territory. He traded 17 cities for the cedars of Lebanon. And uh, and then one generation later, here's Solomon building a temple out of cedars and building a throne, which the basic thing was, was cedars. And a lot of that stuff was used. In. But Solomon, his kingdom is the same, 
you know, it's just passed down to one generation. So in one generation, this guy basically gets this rich. How does a king really make his money? And so here, because here's your answer. There's only two ways that a king makes his money. A king makes his money like David did by capturing territory, by conquering. The other way is taxes, right? I mean, you got the uh, got the entire kingdom paying taxes. Okay, so... I'm thinking that the reason Solomon wrote all this stuff is because he wanted, I mean, man, you read this stuff, it's like how to run your business, how to create a business, how to choose who to marry, how to stay married, uh, you know, how to raise your kids, how to uh, make money, what to do with your money when you make your money, how to turn your money into more money. I mean, it's across the board, man. And... And if you look at that stuff, you'll realize that he wants people to have the very best businesses they can. Because if their businesses are more profitable, a percentage of that profit goes to him. And the better their businesses are, the more money and taxes the kingdom receives. Does that make sense? Now, okay, okay, but why would he tell people like how to raise their kids? Why would he tell people about you know marriage? Why would he, why would he talk to people about that? Because the guy knew that a family that has peace in the family, they're all running their own businesses, right? And so the family that has peace in their family, they have a more profitable business because nobody wants to go in the shop of a shop owner who's in a bad mood and he and his wife are yelling at each other or the kids are running through there playing their radios or whatever they did back then. And and so, so Solomon is saying, okay, I want to tell them how to make their businesses very profitable because I get a percentage of it. And if their families are peaceful and if they're all happy, then they got a better chance of making their businesses work, too. So I'm going to tell them that, too. So basically, this is why. Now, obviously, I've gone a long way around it. We'll talk about this some more. But one of the things that I noticed is one of the things you wrote was about discipline in reverse. Now, it would take me an hour to lay this out, but there is one particular part that I wondered about for a long time. And he said, he, he wrote, I say he said, uh, he wrote, discipline your child while he is young or you will ruin his life. It's curious that he would word it that way. Um, discipline your child while he is young or you, it doesn't say or his life will be ruined. It says you will ruin his life. Isn't that curious? And um, and what I believe that means is is pretty simple. What I believe that means is is something that is the exact opposite of what society does today. Because most people, you know, when the kid is three and four, you know, they're kind of making excuses for the kid. They're making excuses to everybody. He's just a baby. It's just a kid. It's just a baby. And so when he's yakking and screaming and yelling on an airplane or in a restaurant or running through the place, you know, and everybody's annoyed. You know, the parent's going, well, it's just a child. You know, it's just a child. But then, you know, long story short, they tighten up. As the kid gets older, they tighten up. As the kid gets uh, into adolescence, into the teen years, into the late teen years, they tighten up, tighten up, tighten up, tighten up. And at some point, you know, if you got a kid who's 19 years old, they can leave. You know, you can't make them stay. And and then, and then you know, they're gone, and you say, hey, I, you shouldn't be. And they say, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. You said, as long as I was in your house, I'm not in your house anymore. Well, now what do you do? Okay, well, what happens now is that they have to go negotiate life on their own without you as a net. Okay, so so you know, Solomon said, discipline your child while he's young or you will ruin his life. See, here's, here's the thing. The purpose of discipline, the purpose of discipline 
is to create discipline, but a different kind of discipline. The purpose of a parent disciplining a child is so that the child, as the child gets older and older and older, will understand how to discipline themselves. See, discipline should roll into self-discipline. But if we don't discipline when they're children, they become adults without the ability to self-discipline, and in essence, their lives are ruined, okay? Uh, and we've done it because we allowed this to happen. We were the adults. We were the ones who were supposed to understand this. And why do I say their lives are ruined? Because discipline is a constant in the world. When, when a young adult goes into the world, any adult in the world, without the ability to discipline themselves, if they can't discipline themselves, no worry, society will do it for them. You either discipline yourself or society will discipline you. And when society disciplines a person, it is not pretty. Ever. Because society disciplines a person by saying you're under arrest. By saying here is a restraining order. By saying uh, we're never going to have that person back. You know, by saying you're fired. By saying you've bounced a fourth check. And this is not going to continue. You know, if, if an adult doesn't have the ability to discipline themselves, society will do it for them. And so, in effect, Solomon is in favor of discipline that you and I would look at in today's world and say, well, that's kind of discipline in reverse. Because instead of being harder and harder and harder on them as they grow up, instead, we should probably, you know, Tag them right at the beginning of their young little lives. Because then, you know, when this child understands, when I tell you stop, that does not mean that I'm going to tell you five times. Okay? Because at some point, a four-year-old is going to be running toward traffic, chasing after a ball, and you can't say, hey, stop. Hey, stop. I said, stop. I'm counting. One, you better stop. Two, you better stop. I mean, the kid would get hit by a car and die. And so we have to have them understand early. When I, st- when I say stop, that means now. Okay, and so when that kid does stop, you can be sure there is an inkling behind the scenes in that little kid that they are... They're very aware that, yeah, they want to keep going after that ball, but I'm going to stop because she's going to get me if I don't stop. It's the the very first inkling this child ever has that they can make themselves do something they don't want to do to get a result they do want to have. I don't want to stop, but I also don't want to get uh, punished. And so I can make myself stop. That's what discipline is as an adult, too. That's self-discipline. Can you make yourself do something you don't necessarily want to do to get a result you would like to have? Comes out in adults with um, discipline in reverse. Hey, uh, the professional noticer today is sponsored by Kamado Joe Grills. Whew, Kamado Joe Grills. This This is my... This is my favorite. These are my grills, okay? I mean, you know, I don't know the company. Bobby and Carrie own the company. Uh, but all the guys there, Bobby and Carrie and Megan and just the whole bunch, it, you, you, you want to give the greatest gift that will last a lifetime. You want to get yourself a grill that will last a lifetime. You need to check out KamadoJoe.com. All right, KamadoJoe.com. 
Now, I don't know. I don't know about you, but for years and years, I was buying a new grill every two or three years. You know, the old one would rust out. I'd buy a new one. And um, and so Kamado Joe is is one of those things. It, this is not inexpensive, but you will be, you know, you'll be passing this down in your will. You'll be passing this thing down to your grandkids and. This is just the most awesome grill you have ever seen in your life. And it's a great color. <laughs> you know, if you, we've all heard of the other Kamado style grill and the color they have and all like that. And yeah, okay. But what if somebody was to take the very, you know, what if somebody was to take the number one selling product and then point by point by point go through it and make it better in every way and yet the price was virtually the same listen i'm telling you kamado joe grills these are the best okay bunch of guys buddies grillers who got together and 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 created the best grill of all time. Their their charcoal's the best too. I'm just gonna tell you that. I mean, and it's not even close. This is not even close. I could tell you more and more and more, but you just need to go to KamadoJoe.com and check it out for yourself. Don't get a gas grill. All right, don't get a gas grill. Gas. You might as well cook inside. You just it, it, there's no taste. You're just cooking with heat. Don't get a gas grill. KamadoJoe.com observations and answers. Now, that's what we do here. I deliver the observations, as you know. Sometimes they're funny. Sometimes they're serious. Sometimes they're helpful. Sometimes we just have a good time being stupid together. <laughs> but questions are a critical component of the person you and I aspire to become. Nobody should be embarrassed to ask a question. The person who never asks a question, they either know everything or they don't know anything. Always remember the quality of your answers can only be determined by the quality of your questions. This week, our question is from Harrison. He's from Orlando, Florida. Let's listen. Hey, Andy, this is Harrison from Orlando, Florida. Uh, just really want to call and say that how much of it we're enjoying the, the new podcast for the professional noticer. Uh, we found it on iTunes and just really got a lot of enjoyment out of it. I've shared it with all my friends, let them know where they could find it on uh, on iTunes as well as on your on your website, so andyandrews.com. Uh, we really enjoyed the entertainment and the advice uh, as, as part of the podcast. And speaking of advice, one, one thing I've been struggling with is both professionally and, and in my personal life is comparing myself to others. Um, you know, my wife seems to notice it a lot more than I do, but I do see this being a challenge to my personal development. And I was wondering if you could give me some reasons why it's important not to compare myself to others. I think intrinsically I know that, that that's an issue, but really really looking for some specific reasons to help motivate myself to, to, keep, to keep from doing it in the future. I hope that's not a stupid question uh, and it's worthy of your time, but uh, just really really looking for that advice and, and getting, getting, a, getting a, a head in life. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> oh, okay. Thanks, Harrison. And and dude, really, uh, no problem if it's too stupid to use on the podcast. I mean, I, I might accuse you of not listening to the podcast if you think there's anything too stupid uh that or something something that I wouldn't do. Um listen, that is a that is a great question. And I think I think it's a great question because it's such a common situation. You know, you're not calling us and say, hey, I'm having problem killing people. I'm a serial killer, and what can I do to stop? I mean, everybody might go, what? And listen very closely, and they might pass around. But when you say, I'm having problems, and I've probably been doing this for a long time, and it's screwed up a lot of stuff, and I've kind of gotten it down, I'm comparing myself to everybody else, and I'm not happy, and, well, you know, this may not be a sexy question, uh, but... I got to tell you, there's a lot of people that deal with this, including me. I'm just telling you, that is a, it's a tough thing. And 
I think there's a lot of wisdom in your question, Harrison, because when you say, uh, can you perhaps explain some reasons that I should not compare myself with others? When you say that, that makes a lot of sense to me because, uh, you know, there there's, there have been years that I've – I've gone through periods of like just being like, oh my gosh, you know, how look at how old they are and what they're able to do and the places they speak and the things that they do and how many people are listening to their podcast and how many people are reading their books and how many people are buying their books. Listen, it in, in my business, that's an easy thing to do and it's something that'll shut you down. I mean, I understand totally I, when you say... Where where did you put that you mentally sabotage your professional career and your personal life by one behavior? I get it. I I get that because I've done that a lot of times myself. I've I've because I know when I do that, I, I put myself in a mood that I'm not writing as good as I could. I'm not. Doing as good. As, I'm. I'm not being the best me that I could be because I'm trying to be Mike Hyatt or I'm trying to be, you know, somebody like that that I admire. And you know, I'm trying to be Dave Ramsey, and and I'm not Dave Ramsey. I'm not Mike Hyatt. When I try to be Dave Ramsey, when I try to be Mike Hyatt, it actually makes me less of Andy Andrews, whatever the heck that is. And so I jotted down some notes here that really I think I, I I hope answer your question. And so these are these are just some notes. And I and I don't and so here's why I really believe I don't believe you should ever measure your success by what other people have or haven't done. It's just not it's not fair to them, it's not fair to us. Because people are either a voice or an echo. You know, they're a they're a thermometer or they're a thermostat. It's hard to put that pressure on yourself of other people because what you're doing is you're letting other people tell you what you want. We should never take anybody else's definition of success as our own because nobody nobody can build a personal destiny on the faith or the experience of anybody else. You have to... um, I heard I heard a guy say this one time, and it's about this. There's an old man that told me this. He said, he said, son, you have to do your own growing. It don't matter how tall your granddaddy is. <laughs> and that's really true, isn't it? I think that successful people I think successful truly successful people are rarely concerned about what anybody else is thinking. I think that people would worry less about what other people think about them if, if they would just realize how seldom other people actually think about them. Yeah, I told my 16-year-old son the other day, you know, he was telling me something about uh, how the kids in school are and what the kids in school think and what they do. And I said, you know, Adam, your mom and I spent the first part of our life, I said, probably the first 12 or 13 years, really not caring what anybody thought about us. But then we went into a period of our lives, I, I guess mom did, I certainly did, went into a period of our lives where we went from not caring what anybody thought about us to caring what everybody thought about us. And I said, now, you know, I'm in what most people call middle age, and I've gone from not caring what anybody thought about me to caring what everybody thought about me to a point now that I realize there wasn't anybody thinking about me to begin with. Everybody's thinking about themselves. Just remember, Harrison, if you're thinking you're doing better than the average person, you're probably an average person. Okay, because kind of the average person does that. Why would you want to compare yourself with somebody average? You wouldn't. I feel like I have hit my stride by going the other direction. You know, right now I'm talking with uh, with one of my clients just about decisions they're having to make. And, you know, I'm like, yeah, okay, consult management. You know, and if they hate the idea, go with it. <laughs> if they like the idea, then you need to reconsider. 
you know, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Higher market research. If they say the idea will fail, you're probably going in the right direction. It's, at least if you want to succeed greatly. You know, when everybody you know says the idea is crazy, then, then plow ahead, because there you go. Martin Luther, you know who Martin Luther is? He wrote the thing and nailed it on the door. Wasn't that Martin Luther? Is that Martin Luther, Matt? Yeah. Okay, yeah, it's Martin Luther. But I, I've got a quote from Martin Luther, and I love this. He said, every guy, every, every guy has got to do two things alone. He has to do his own believing and his own dying. So you got to believe what you choose. You're going to be alone in it most of the time, but you got to believe what you choose, and you got to choose what you believe. When, when you compare yourself with other people, you're going to either be bitter or you're going to be vain, right? You're, you're either going to be horrified or you're going to turn into an arrogant sucker because there's always going to be greater people and people that aren't as great as you. So making comparisons is a sure pathway to being frustrated and Harrison Comparison is never proof of anything to begin with. Okay, now you ask for some reasons why you shouldn't compare. I have a friend, and this is a story, but I have a friend who one day was talking to a friend of his, and this friend of mine's very, very successful. And this friend of his, he had not talked to him in several years, and his friend has said that uh, for, for years he had felt bad about his life because of the success that had happened in his other friend, my friend. He, he felt bad about his life because of the success my friend had had. <laughs> my friend said, so would you have felt a lot better if I'd done horribly? <laughs> and of course the guy said, well, no, no. But that just points out some mutually exclusive things. And that is that what's happened in somebody else's life is no basis for how well or how badly you're going to do on your own. Your life is going to be a lot more fun if you don't keep score against everybody else. All right? You, you don't want to compare your purpose. Your purpose is to create. You want to create who you are, who your family is, who, who people believe they are. A, a wise person is going to make his own decisions, but an ignoramus is just going to follow what everybody else has done. So don't, don't necessarily think that you're on the right road just because everybody's on that road. You want to compare your place, you want to compare your plan with your purpose, with your purpose in life. Okay? Hey, thanks so much. For the question. I think that'll do it. Get us out of here, Matthew. So, ladies and gentlemen, and to the boys and girls who aspire to become ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of another episode of The Professional Noticer. In a world where common sense has become a superpower, I'm harnessing what small amount of mental energy I have for you. Seeking wisdom, making observations, and endeavoring to answer tough questions in a way that will empower your family and your business. I'm Andy Andrews. Until next week, smile while you talk, shake hands with the kids you meet, and make sure you have an answer to the question, Pavlov, why does that name ring a bell? And so, until next week, goodbye. This episode of The Professional Noticer was produced by Matt Limbert. The Noticer theme, written and performed by Sugarcane J. Hairball removal, provided by Twinkle and Smoke of Beverly Hills. Additional financial consideration, provided by Forever 13, a nonprofit organization created to teach people just how to keep kidding themselves for the rest of their lives. Simply by joining a local chapter, and they are everywhere. 
you can learn to incorporate the focus and brain power of a kid going through puberty. Soon, you'll be effortlessly using phrases like, that's not my job, what's wrong with the way I'm dressed, I did it last time, and everyone is against me. So, join Forever 13 and enjoy your adult life with the result you'd get if you really were that age.